Hello and welcome everyone. This is the second podcast for day 26. In this podcast we will cover the second half of Objective 1 and we will undertake these various um, concepts and explain what they are and close with explaining how natural selection does not make a perfect organism. Let's go ahead and get started. Now your book talks about some interesting ways that that individuals are selected for in their path to increase reproductive success. And and one of these terms is called sexual dimorphism. So your book has this really good example of sexual dimorphism. We see the very colorful peacock here and the less colorful pea hen here. Sexual dimorphism are differences in secondary sexual characteristics between males and females of the same species. So none of the primary sexual features, but the secondary ones like color or maybe a mating dance. So this elaborate color makes this male more attractive to this female. The female is a much more basic color that allows it to blend in with the environment, which is really important because she's going to be the one caring for the young. So that's sexual dimorphism. The next one is intrasexual. Let's go ahead and write something about sexual dimorphism. We should have done that um, before, but we'll say differing secondary sexual characteristics. Intrasexual. This is when one is when individuals of the same sex compete directly for mates. This is usually males that do this, not exclusively, but usually. Some examples might be when you have the two male rams competing for the mate by having a battle. And, you know, you've probably seen these videos before when they uh, ram into each other and the winner um, is the one selected then by the female. I'm going to show you a video of this. Okay, so here are some examples of bighorn sheep ramming into each other, the males here. And these are an effort to show dominance. So let's write a quick definition for this. All right, then this next one is called intersexual. And this is when, when one of the sexes is choosier. When one of the sexes is choosy about their mate. To talk about this, let's go back to our pictures of the peacock and the pea hen. So this female now, she has many choices of these various peacocks doing this some sort of elaborate dance, elaborate colors. And so she can be choosy at which one she picks. And so the males, they invest a lot of energy into the various mating dances, um, having elaborate colors in their feathers. So they attract the female, so that they are have an advantage, and their adaptive evolution is that they are able to reproduce more because the female chooses this particular male. Now, at first thought, it seems that this might not be a very good thing for this male peacock to do. How does this lead to an increased reproductive success? Because it seems like having all these bright colors and dancing around out here in this brown dirt here might be a very disadvantaged because any predators of the peacock can readily see the peacock and attack attack him. However, that outweighs the benefit of attracting the right females so that he can be successful. Again, this is a good example of how we might not always be able to predict what the most fit organism is. Sure, the if there's a brown peacock around here, it may not be eaten as easily 
but it's also not going to be very successful at passing on its genes. All right, one of the last terms we need to talk about here is heterozygous advantage. So let's write that here. And what this means is, and let's just come up with some generic um, words here, letters here. And they're not really generic. You'll see why I'm picking these in a moment. Big B, heterozygous big B, little b, and little b, little b. In a case where we have uh, issues of heterozygous advantage, both the homozygous dominant and the homozygous recessive are disadvantaged for one way or another. And when we speak about evolutionary terms, when we say it's disadvantaged, we mean that they are not going to produce as many progeny. They have a lower reproductive success. However, as a heterozygote, they have an advantage. And in this, the, probably the, one of the classic examples of a heterozygous advantage is found in the disease sickle cell anemia. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's draw a red blood cell here. A red blood cell well, lacks a nucleus, so I'm just going to draw an empty circle there. A red blood cell, it's packed full of this protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin helps deliver oxygen throughout the cell and then to retrieve carbon dioxide and take it outside of the cell. Outside of the organism, I should say. The red blood cell also has to be incredibly flexible because it has to fit through very small capillaries. These are the smallest blood vessels in our body. So it has to be very flexible. One of the proteins that make up hemoglobin is the beta subunit. That's why I chose B up here. So we know that individuals who are, let's change colors here, have a big B, big B for the, for the beta subunit of hemoglobin. We know that these individuals are healthy. Or actually, let's say this way, have a functional hemoglobin. And we know individuals who are heterozygous for this also have a functional hemoglobin. Homozygous recessives have sickle cell anemia. So you might argue right now that this heterozygote doesn't have an advantage. What I just described to you is that it's the same as the homozygous dominant. Well, the catch here is it depends on where you're at. And I know my drawings are horrible, but let's draw Africa here again. And in certain regions of Africa, several regions, there are uh, high incidences of malaria. I'm just drawing one of the regions here. High inc incidences of malaria. Malaria is a disease that insects will carry. They will carry this parasite that will then infect humans, and in humans um, the parasite will begin to destroy the, our red blood cells and can lead to death if not treated appropriately. So in these areas here, malaria is a major source of concern and evolution has found a way to help individuals. And what happens is that individuals who are homozygous dominant, who have a functional hemoglobin, are, they, they can get malaria. So that's a bad thing. It also turns out the individuals, well I should say that, the individuals who are homozygous recessive do not get malaria. I'm going to erase this word here. Interestingly, the people who are heterozygotes also do not get malaria. So let's review this and explain why the heterozygote has an advantage. A homozygous dominant, they have functional hemoglobin, but they get malaria in areas where malaria is predominant. The homozygous recessive, they have sickle cell anemia, but they don't get malaria. So you can see both extremes, homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, have a problem that's going to interfere with their relative fitness, that is their ability to produce many offspring. They have sickle cell anemia, they get malaria. These individuals, the heterozygotes, they have a functional hemoglobin, so that's good, and they also don't get malaria. So these individuals immediately have an advantage compared to these two here, 
because they don't have sickle cell anemia and they don't get malaria, they will be more fit. And again, in our terms, more fit means they produce more progeny. Okay, I'm gonna erase this. And the last thing we wanna cover here is the fact that evolution is not perfect. Evolution does not make a perfect organism. And there are four reasons your book talks about it, and I think we should talk about all four of these. And the first one is that natural selection works with the phenotypes and hence the alleles available. New alleles just don't magically arise. Sure, you can get some new ones um, due to mutations, but again, we talked about how those can be either good or bad. But natural selection only lead, is the only one that consistently leads to adaptive evolution. But the drawback is it can only work with what's available. If you have a toolbox and you need a screwdriver, but the screwdriver's not in there, you can't make a screwdriver magically appear. If an organism needed to have wings, it's not just going to form wings. This just doesn't happen. It can only work with what's available. Evolution is limited by its historical constraints. So I'm just going to write historical constraints. So this means that an organism only can work with, say, the anatomy, its ancestors gave them. For instance, when birds evolved, they didn't go back and erase the anatomy of the flightless animals before it. It had to work with the anatomy that was already there. So for instance, if you had some animal here, prepared to be wild, that had legs and it walked on land, let's give it a head, everything should have a head, and give it a tail here. If a bird was going to evolve, from this population here, it's not magically going to keep the legs and form wings. It's not going to somehow or another erase the anatomy of the legs and form wings here. It can't do that. That's not how it works. What has to happen is that it has to work with what it has, the anatomy that its ancestors gave them. And so the wings of birds and bats evolved from these limbs. It didn't erase them, it didn't get rid of them, it used what it had. And these limbs eventually became wings. I hesitate to draw this. Right? Let's give it a head. Oh my gosh, that's horrible. But anyhow, you get the point. That the legs, the, the, the birds that would arise, had to use the legs from the flightless ancestor. Again, you can't erase the anatomy that you're given with, you're kind of stuck with it, and that's what evolution has to work with. Alright, I'm going to erase these two here so I can talk about the last two. This one is that adaptations are often compromises. I'm going to show you this quick video of a seal. Okay, so our example here is going to be a seal. I'm going to show you a video of that. Okay, here's a pretty good example of watching a seal walk on land. They're not very good. They can't hardly use their limbs. In fact, they just kind of use their belly to kind of move from place to place. So it's not very efficient at all. And here's an example of some other kinds of seals as they walk. Maybe a little bit better, but still not as well. They're not really designed for walking. 
Here's another example here with the seals walking on rocks. Really, their flippers aren't designed for that. Yes, we're talking about you. And we can see one of the predators there is the great white shark. Probably the biggest predator is the killer whale. Okay, here you see the shark and the seals. See how fast and adept and agile the flippers help the seals in the water. Much better than on land. There he's doing some tricks. I shouldn't say tricks. He's just swimming like he usually does. Again, the flippers are well suited for the water. But on land, not so much. That's the compromise they have made. So pretty fast swimming, but of course, we're going to see in a moment that the sharks sometimes will catch one of them. Um, the sharks have to eat too. But most of them can get away. That's the key, right? As you can see, that seal had has had, lives in two different areas. It lives in land, lives on land, I should say, and it lives in water. Yet it has the same appendages. Right? It still has the same limbs to work with. Those limbs aren't so good on land. As you can see, the seal does okay. But they're not really built for running. However, in water, they're really good. And the seals can swim really fast and with great agility. So it was a compromise. We compromised, or the seals, throughout evolution. Again, they didn't choose it. These are just the alleles that were selected for throughout um, natural selection. So what was selected were the flippers that gave them this agility here. And maybe that was more important because that helped them get away from some natural predators. Whereas on land, there weren't as many natural predators, so they could sacrifice their land, their land um, speed. But had to maintain this in order to survive and to have that um, increased reproductive success. Okay, our fourth example here. Often it's just by pure chance that individuals interact with an environment. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you have, well, we can use the, the um, example of the Galapagos Island, right? So we have South America here, and then we have the Galapagos Islands here. If birds or insects were blown from South America over here, that was just a chance event that they landed on this island. The alleles that they brought with them, that they packed with them on this trip that they weren't expecting, the alleles that came with them were selected for over many generations for this environment. But now they just got taken to this new environment. Those alleles might not have been well adapted for this environment. And so it's by chance that these individuals ended up on this environment. And so now evolution can occur with this new population. Again, it's still with the constraints of being stuck with these alleles that, that they were sent with. And so they have to evolve using those that they have. Okay, that ends this podcast. If you have any questions, please let us know. We'll be happy to help you.